Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this Federalist Society event, the Russian-Ukrainian conflict. My name is Douglas Maggs, and I am the Vice President for Speakers for UVA Law's Federalist Society chapter. The Federalist Society is delighted to acknowledge and thank three other UVA Law student organizations who are co-sponsoring today's event. They are the National Security Law Forum, the J.B. Moore Society of International Law, and LIST, the Law, Innovation, Security, and Technology Organization. An important purpose of this event is to answer your questions about the ongoing and rapidly developing situation in Ukraine. You may submit questions starting now via the Zoom Q&A function and continue to submit questions throughout the event. We'll get to as many of your questions as we can. Today, we're very fortunate to be joined by two UVA law professor experts in the field. Professor Christian Eikenser writes and teaches about cybersecurity, foreign relations, international law, and national security law. She has written on, among other issues, the attribution of state-sponsored cyber attacks, the important roles that private parties play in cybersecurity, the constitutional allocation of powers between the president and Congress in foreign relations, and the role of foreign sovereign amici in the Supreme Court. In 2021, she became the director of UVA Law's National Security Law Center. Eichen Sayre is the editor of the American Journal of International Law section on contemporary practice of the United States relating to international law, and a member of the editorial boards of the national security blog, Just Security, and of the Journal of National Security Law and Policy. Professor Eichen Sayre clerked for Justices Sandra Day O'Connor and Soda, Sonia Sotomayor of the Supreme Court of the United States and also for Judge Merrick Garland of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. She also served as a special assistant to the legal advisor of the U.S. Department of State and previously has practiced at Covington and Burling in Washington, D.C. <laughs> Professor Paul Steffen is an expert on hey, international... Honey. Excuse me, Stephen. Is an expert on, on international business, international dispute resolution, and comparative law, with an emphasis on Soviet and post-Soviet legal systems. He has advised governments and international organizations taken part in cases in the Supreme Court of the United States, the federal courts, and various foreign judicial and arbitral proceedings, and lectured to professionals and scholarly groups around the world on issues raised by the globalization of the world economy. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, he took part in a variety of projects involving law reform in former socialist states. He worked in Russia, Georgia, Ukraine, Albania, and Slovakia on behalf of the US Treasury, and in Kazakhstan and Azerbaijan on behalf of the International Monetary Fund. He received his BA and his MA from Yale University in 1973 and 74, respectively, and his JD from the University of Virginia in 1977. Before returning to Virginia, he clerked for Judge Levin Campbell of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the First Circuit and also for U.S. Supreme Court Justice Lewis F. Powell, Jr. Professors, thank you both very much for being here today and joining this event. Thank you, Douglas, and thanks to the FEDSOC, the National Security Law Forum, LIST, and the J.B. Moore Society for convening this really timely panel. It's a pleasure to be here with uh, my colleague, Paul who is the real expert on Russia. So I will just make a few opening remarks here and I wanna talk about three points and then I'll turn it over to Paul to give you more of the Russian perspective. So I wanna talk about the effect of this conflict on Ukraine, the effect on the international legal system and then the possible cybersecurity implications and, and effects of the conflict. So first and foremost, this war and invasion is a tragedy for the people of Ukraine. They will be bearing the brunt of the horrific destruction that Russia is undertaking. And the United States and its allies need to do whatever possible to mitigate the humanitarian harms of this conflict, to help refugees, and to insist on compliance with the laws of armed conflict. So the rules of the use in Bello or international humanitarian law, which is of course quite a euphemism, um, apply to parties to an international armed conflict regardless of how it started. They're designed to apply even when the international system and international law has failed to avoid conflict as it has here. As it has here. And there have already been reports of Russian strikes on civilian targets, including one near a hospital that Amnesty International confirmed yesterday. So even as things unfold, it's important to be working to document war crimes, crimes against humanity, and to be looking forward to a day when hopefully the international system will bring perpetrators of those crimes to justice. My second point is about the legality of this conflict and about its effects on the international legal system. 
So first and foremost, this is an aggressive war. It is illegal and the international system obviously failed to stop it. The UN Charter and the United Nations system were established in the wake of World War II and Russia's actions here clearly violate the Charter's most basic principles. The illegality is just extremely clear. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said on Monday night after Russia recognized uh, the independence of the two Eastern regions of Ukraine, and he considers the decision of the Russian Federation to be a violation of the territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine and inconsistent with the principles of the Charter of the United Nations. It's pretty remarkable to see the UN Secretary General calling out a member of the P5, the permanent five members of the Security Council in real time for violating the UN Charter. And US Ambassador to the UN, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, told the Security Council on Wednesday that Russia's attack on Ukraine is tantamount to an attack on the United Nations and every member state in the chamber. And she noted that Russia's invasion undermines the institution and undermines everyone who participates in it. Part of the reason that the illegality of Russia's actions here is so clear is because of the actions the Biden administration has taken over the last few weeks to strategically declassify intelligence. So the warnings that you've seen in the media about pretexts and false flag operations that Russia would use to claim a justification for invading. US intel community has, I think, been proven extremely accurate in its forecasts about Russia's plans. And at least in my opinion, that the Biden administration deserves a lot of credit for using those strategic disclosures to undermine Russian claims and also to build unity among allies about the illegality of Russia's actions and the need for a significant response. So there, there is no fig leaf of legality here for Putin to hide behind. At the same time, of course, not all countries have denounced Russia. There's been a lot of consensus on the denunciations, but not perfect. And one of the really big exceptions has been China. For all of China's championing of the rhetoric of sovereignty and sovereignty as a rule that the international system should respect, it doesn't seem to care much at, at all uh, for Ukraine sovereignty. And more broadly, I think this invasion is, as the US ambassador to the UN said, a, a massive challenge to the international legal system and to the United Nations. It's a violation of the most fundamental rule on which the post-World War II legal order was built, that wars of conquest are illegal and that the use of force is prohibited. And it's, I think, deeply unsettling that international institutions, the United States, NATO, alliances, were unable to prevent this invasion from happening. The question that some are now asking is whether this is really the death knell for that system, for that version of international legal order that has reigned since World War II. I think it's too early to say. I sincerely hope it's not. Um, certainly the failure to deter the invasion and to prevent the invasion is a blow to that system, but there have been other blows before and violations of law don't mean that there is no law or that there is no purpose to the law. We certainly don't think that in the domestic sphere criminal violations, criminal the existence of crime doesn't destroy, destroy criminal law, it doesn't destroy government. And it's also been clear for a very long time since the outbreak of the Cold War that the UN Security Council system with its veto for the um, five permanent members is really deeply flawed. And the veto that Russia holds as a permanent member of the Security Council here is gonna destroy the council's ability to act in a meaningful way. But again, this is not the first time the structure of the council system um, has meant for decades that the council's ability to act in conflicts involving the permanent five members is uh, limited if, if existent at all. So this is just another case in point. And I think the question now is how the world responds. We've seen nearly uniform reaffirmation of the prohibition on the use of force. And I think greater unity, unity among many countries because of just how egregious Russia's actions are as well as a willingness and a unified willingness among a lot of countries to impose pretty costly sanctions. So I think that the verdict is still out on sort of the impact of this on the international legal system. The last thing I wanna address briefly before turning it over to Paul is the cybersecurity aspects of this conflict. Um, so for years, Russia has used Ukraine as basically a test ground for cyber attacks. It attempted election interference in 2014, it shut off the power in Ukraine to Kiev twice in 2015 and then again in 2016. It's repeatedly launched destructive malware, plus its usual disinformation campaigns. And we're seeing more of the same from Russia uh, in the course of this conflict over the last month. So in the last month, we've seen destructive malware launched against Ukrainian government websites. Last week, the US and the UK attributed denial of service attacks against Ukrainian banks to Russia's GRU. And since Russia's invasion just in the last few days, 
There's been more destructive malware and DDoS attacks on government and bank websites and disinformation campaigns launched via text message about malfunctioning ATMs and other issues. I would expect for Ukraine all of that to continue um, in an effort to prevent the Ukrainian government from communicating with its people and with the rest of the world and to sow chaos and confusion in the midst of the, uh, the invasion. For countries outside of Ukraine, including the United States, there are two major types of cybersecurity concerns. The first is deliberate attacks by Russia on other countries, and the second is spillover from attacks on Ukraine itself. So on the first of those deliberate attacks, the possibility of deliberate attacks on the United States, there is concern that Russia might retaliate for the, the sanctions that the United States and others are imposing by striking at the United States or other countries that are doing the sanctioning. The United States has warned as far back as 2018 that Russian government cyber actors had targeted and gained access to US critical infrastructure, including the energy sector, and that they had access that would allow them to shut down or otherwise manipulate power plants. This, if it came to pass, would be very escalatory. Um, CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency in DH, the Department of Homeland Security, has been warning critical infrastructure operators to harden their defenses for weeks. They've uh, labeled this as a, a campaign called Shields Up. They know their audience. Um, and President Biden said last week that if Russia attacks the United States or our allies through asymmetric means like disruptive cyber attacks against our companies or critical infrastructure, we are prepared to respond. That kind of a response brings up a host of legal questions that I'm happy to discuss in Q&A. But concretely, what that response might look like is certainly assistance to any companies or other countries that are um, the victims of such attacks. And media reports have also indicated for the last few years that the United States has compromised Russian power and other systems, Russian critical infrastructure with malware that could cripple them. So that I think is a, a serious concern about getting into an escalatory spiral with Russia on the cyber front. But the second kind of cybersecurity risk, and the one that I think is probably more likely, is unintentional spillover uh, from cyber attacks aimed at Ukraine. And the reason I think that's more likely is that we've seen it before. So in 2017, Russia launched um, malware called NotPetya against uh, Ukrainian systems. And it didn't stay in Ukraine. It uh, boomeranged around the world and ended up causing $10 billion in damage. It hit companies like FedEx, Maersk, and Merck. Merck just recently won a, a judgment against an insurance company for coverage of, of that incident. So what starts in Ukraine doesn't stay there necessarily, at least in the cybersphere. And so it's something I think is, is concerning in the next few weeks and months um, as we look ahead. So Paul, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, that was wonderful. And I will begin by saying I agree with every word. Uh, I'm going to talk about something uh, related, complementary, I hope, but not uh, the overlap. Uh, my role is to convey as best I can uh, the Russian perspective on these events. Uh, it's a tricky thing to do because uh, it's easy for an audience to confuse an account of an adversary's perspective with sympathy with the adversary. Uh, and uh, uh, I could go on about how that is not the case with respect to me. Uh, I'll just say one of my credentials is that I'm part of the Covington and Burling team that has been suing Russia with respect to the expropriation of the assets of the Ukrainian energy company, state energy company in Crimea. So I, I hope my uh, uh, adversarialness to the Russian Federation is well established. But I still think uh, to advise our leaders in the administration, uh, as well as the American public uh, about what we're up against, we need accurate, balanced, well-considered assessments of what the Russians are up to. Uh, so uh, put it, putting it very briefly, I think the principal goal of the Russians at this stage is to return Ukraine to the status quo 20, anti 2014. That is to say a government that asks Moscow first what it can do before it does anything of, internet, of great international significance. Uh, uh, that was the status of Ukraine for most of its independence. 
and uh, the shift in its orientation, particularly in 2014, is seen by uh, Russia as the product of gross and unacceptable American and European interference in Ukrainian domestic affairs. I'm not saying it was, I'm, I'm simply trying to convey the Russian perspective of the events of 2013, 2014. Uh, secondly, uh, the goal I think is to exploit what they perceive as weaknesses and disunity in the West, particularly Europe, and particularly with respect to Germany as opposed to the rest of Europe. Uh, Russia has enjoyed the favor of having uh, the last German social democratic chancellor serve as essentially its uh, paid agent since he stepped down as chancellor uh, as an employee of a, a Gazprom subsidiary and still even with the invasion as a prominent spokesman for Russian interests. Uh, so, uh, uh, I think from the German perspective, that might be seen as peacemaking, uh, avoiding the brunt of a tragedy that they uh, may have indeed did bring on themselves, but still uh, they uh, felt the brunt of. Um, and I, I think some of that from the German perspective may be a product of what they saw as the fecklessness and unreliability of the Americans in 2003 with respect to the Iraq invasion. Uh, I, I don't adjudicate any of those issues. I'm just trying to convey what I think are those perspectives. In any event, Russia would love to detach Germany even further from Europe as a whole and the United States in particular, whether that's likely, uh, again, I have no judgment on that. I'm, I'm just trying to uh, take that into account as part of their interests. And then last and least, I think of, of importance to the Russians, is to embarrass the United States to show it as uh, not in control of events. Uh, uh, quickly, I, I will say that the path that Russia has chosen is very dangerous. Uh, Russia is not in control of events and uh, things could quickly get out of hands in a way that is harmful, not just to Ukraine, uh, but blow back on everybody and affect everybody. Uh, so it's, uh, a, a very dangerous course that they're pursuing. Um, I, I might say uh, two words about uh, issues that Kristen raised, not from the perspective of the uh, our sense of what international law is, but again, from the, the Russian take on these things. One is the uh, role of the United Nations principles in the hierarchy of international order. I, I think it is true that uh, both Russia and China have articulated at different times fairly clearly that they think there are principles about international stability and the global interests of the international system that transcend the UN Charter. Uh, they have their own takes on what they are and they are takes that turn out to give them free passes to do uh, what uh, very well can be seen as very dangerous things. Uh, but uh, that I think has been a consistent pattern in the Russian take on the international system. I think the amendments to the Russian constitution made in 2020 and the joint statements of principle between uh, Beijing and Moscow, most recently, I think about a month ago, uh, incorporate this perspective. Uh, I, I think the, an appropriate response to this perspective is, well, once we start allowing uh, self-declared exceptions, by self-declared, I mean not needing to get the consent of others and particularly other great powers in the international system, uh, where does this end? Uh, I think that's a very legitimate question, but I think that's their take on these things. Uh, and then on the issue of the future of the international system forged in the wake of the Cold War, um, I, I will engage in a moment of shameless self-promotion and say, I have a book coming out on this subject. Uh, it's called uh, The World Crisis and International Law slash colon whatever, uh, the knowledge economy and the battle for the future, 
which tries to talk about this in the context, not just of this current East-West conflict, but more generally the uh, series of, of uh, disruptions in the international system we've seen in the last five or six years, the rise of national populism, uh, the rise of revisionist power in, among our adversaries, the change aspirations of not just Russia, but China, um, the uh, uh, economic uh, challenges that we faced uh, beginning with the Great Recession, but uh, who knows what the consequences of the quite necessary uh, sanctions regimes will be. And then COVID uh, as an example of the fragility of the international system. Uh, I think this is a test. Uh, it is, of course, my fond hope that the uh, values and principles that uh, we espouse and often live by will uh, be up to the challenge. Uh, but I, I think we have to look at our future in the next five to 10 years as confronting a challenge that we did not anticipate in 1991 and navigating uh, problems that uh, our historic experiences, the experiences of the Cold War, for example, don't really provide great templates for. So I, and the cyber problems that Kristen uh, refers to, uh, and I, I think, uh, tease up for us uh, as well as anyone could do uh, are just an example of the challenges that we face going forward. Uh, so uh, to, to leave you with, not with pessimism with, but with a, a bracing message, uh, I, I think the present generation faces uh, circumstances that your predecessors uh, have not faced. It's a different world from the world that uh, uh, developed in the early 90s, and that it will require the creativity, the resilience, the um, ingenuity of everyone, but particularly international lawyers, uh, to respond to these challenges. Thank you. Thank you both very much for your initial remarks. We'll turn to question and answer now, and I will invite all of our participants to uh, continue to use the Q&A function as you already have been doing. Uh, I will exercise moderator's prerogative to ask a first question, and that would be, uh, would you care to weigh in as to the timeline? Here we are in 2022. Professor Stephen, you mentioned how the situation in Ukraine had a bit of a watershed moment back in 2014. Why did it take eight years to escalate to this point? Do you think that there's anything specific about other current circumstances, things that come to mind, or as you mentioned, COVID, uh, the recently concluded Chinese Olympics, allowing for more space in the international scene? Was this an inevitable moment, or was this a calculated time for Putin and the Russians to commence the next phase of their Ukrainian endeavors? Listen, you want me to take the first step on that? Yeah. So I don't know, but these are my guesses. Uh, point one is that the Zelensky regime since coming to power in Ukraine has uh, uh, doubled down on its relationship with NATO, uh, done more training. Uh, I, I, I think realistically the prospect of full Ukrainian membership in NATO even before the current events were extremely unlikely. Uh, and, and the contingency on which it happening would be a general collapse of Russia, uh, which I don't see as a short-term prospect. Uh, but uh, from Russia's perspective, uh, they have regarded uh, going back to 2004, uh, really going back, I'd say to 1997, uh, any relationship between NATO and Ukraine is completely unacceptable uh, at the time that they uh, reached an agreement with uh, NATO in 1997 about its expansion at that time, they simultaneously reached an agreement with Ukraine uh, about the uh, non-involvement of Ukraine in anything NATO. Uh, the, uh, 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 it, it was really the coming to power of a uh, regime in 1919 that uh, 
uh, saw real prospects of, of uh, US military support and through that NATO support that I think alarmed the Russians. Uh, uh, I, I'm again, not saying that the alarm was justified. I'm just trying to look at it from their lenses. There have been other cultural things going on in Ukraine, uh, uh, a cutting back on some Russian language services, uh, a willingness to re, uh, I think the main reason is just that since 2014, since the annexation of Crimea, uh, that uh, uh, the remnant of Ukraine has found it uh, uh, from a national political perspective, understandably antagonistic to Russia and the need for Ukrainian politicians to respond to that. So that uh, the annexation in 2014 set off a cycle of uh, increased tensions between the two countries. Uh, and then I would add to that, that in the wake of the various crises of the last five years, uh, there is a growing perception on the part of Russians, uh, uh, correct or not, uh, that the West and the United States are softer targets than they were even as far uh, as recently as 2014, that they can get away with more, or at least they're willing to take that risk so I think that's why now rather than any time before now. And yeah, it is interesting that they waited till the Olympics were over. I'll just pick up very briefly on, on the last point that, that Paul uh, mentioned there. I mean, I think the over the last five years, we've seen some pretty severe ruptures in the US relationship with Europe, uh, under certainly under the Trump administration, a lot of antagonism in those relationships that was um, yeah. certainly could have contributed to a perception that there was less unity among the NATO alliance and among the U.S. Western European alliance. Also, I mean, I think there's a, an amount of disunity there caused, of course, by Brexit and the U.K.'s departure from the European Union, which is another signal of a lack of unity. Um, and then, you know, just in the last year, back in the fall, when the Biden administration and Australia and the UK announced the AUKUS alliance in an attempt to counter China, that caused some very public dust-ups, particularly with the French, who um, had a, a nuclear submarine cancellation, uh, contract ca cancellation in response to Australia now sourcing subs from the US and the UK. So I think that there are some signs that that alliance, the, those alliance structures have been frayed in the last couple of years. But I think perhaps um, Putin overestimated the extent to which that was true. The Biden administration has done a lot of work in the last year to rebuild those alliances, to tether itself more tightly to the UK, to the EU, to NATO, including resolving things like trade disputes um, and some things that have been long-term irritants in the relationship. And uh, again, you know, I think the, the egregiousness of the Russian actions here and the strategic disclosures the Biden administration has been undertaking for the last month and a half, a couple of months, have actually brought those alliances much closer together. So I think perhaps if that was the plan um, to exploit disunity, I think maybe Putin overplayed his hand. I, I would agree completely. And I just very quickly, the thing to watch is when, if the Nord Stream uh, uh, pause is uh, re, uh, called off, uh, the longer the Germans hold fast, the uh, greater hope one can have for the efforts the Biden administration are undertaking. In your answers to that question, both of you referred to NATO, I'm going to try and combine two questions that we have here. The first is, what does an acceptable geopolitical outcome look like for the West, for NATO allied countries, given that Russia has now formally invaded? And then building off of that as well, to what extent do you see Russia wargaming on behalf of China, a possible Chinese invasion of Taiwan. Question reads, how do you see US justification that Ukraine isn't NATO playing out if or when a Taiwanese invasion might occur, uh, Taiwan being another non-NATO territory, but perhaps one, as the questioner asks, with more strategic importance to the US? Does it play out similarly or differently? Paul, do you want to start? <laughs> well, I, I, I will. I will. Uh, so, um, uh, the first question: What is acceptable? Uh, well, we kind of NATO kind of accepted what happened in Crimea, which, it, just as a formal legal matter, was a greater violation in that it was an annexation, not merely an occupation. Um, so, 
uh, if by what is acceptable, we mean what can we tolerate, how much we need to hold our nose as we do so. Uh, a scenario that might play out in the next 48 hours, which is a surrounded Kiev capitulates, sort of like Paris in 1870, um, and there is a change in government in Ukraine that uh, satisfies the principal Russian objectives. Um, I, I can understand sanctions continuing for a period of time, but no more urgent interventions to block that. I'm not saying that's a good outcome. I'm just saying that I could see that as an outcome that people could hold their nose and tolerate. Although I'm saying this as a private citizen, uh, back uh, what, seven months ago when I was in the government uh, as part of the Biden administration, I would have never said anything like that because you never let the other side know what your deal point is. Um, uh, as to China, I think we, uh, I have believed for 50 years, uh, and it's amazing that one could remember what one believed 50 years ago, but I actually was working in this field that have been working that long, uh, that the United States does not really get China. Uh, and as a result, uh, thinks there's greater possibilities with China than there is with Russia, because we understand Russia better, even if not well enough. Uh, and uh, point one would be there's a fundamental adversarial relationship between China and Russia, uh, that they can collaborate over the short term, just as the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany collaborated over the short term. But their fundamental interests are profoundly adversarial, um, for what it's worth. Uh, secondly, uh, Pessimistically, under, if the Shanghai uh, communique is still valid, uh, the UN principles of sovereignty are not implicated by any military actions China takes with respect to Taiwan. It's a matter of Chinese inter internal affairs. Both the Nixon administration and the Mao regime articulated it that way. They just disagreed about things such as whether force could was an appropriate way of resolving the eternal affairs question. Uh, having said that, I think Taiwan is a far more serious uh, concern to the United States. It implicates our national interests far more greatly than Ukraine. Uh, and therefore we should be more concerned about how our response to the current crisis might affect Chinese perceptions even though I don't think the legal tools are the same in framing the uh, Taiwan Chinese conflict. I agree with that. I think the perception issue with respect to China is extremely important. And I think, you know, as Paul was explaining, successive US administrations have, have perhaps underestimated um, China or, or misunderstood China in various ways. There was just a report, I think this morning in the Washington Post about how the United States had over the course of the last few months approached China repeatedly and laid out intelligence and basically asked China to appeal to Russia to back off Ukraine and got absolutely nowhere. Uh, so, you know, I take Paul's point that China and Russia's long-term interests are not necessarily aligned, but I guess Yes, I'm a little concerned that the short term may last a while. And while their interests are aligned, that's problematic and, um, you know, could have a whole range of consequences. So one is that the relationship between China and Russia could blunt the impact of the sanctions that the United States and its allies are attempting to impose on Russia. Uh, China could help Russia evade those sanctions in, in some ways. And, you know, obviously the, the atmospherics of this the Biden administration was attempting, as the Obama administration had, to effectuate a kind of pivot to Asia and views China as the longer term, more important strategic threat to the United States. But once again, the United States is now distracted, right? In 2014, um, it was distraction with respect to the Middle East and ISIS. Now it's distraction with respect to Russia and Ukraine. So it, it, there is a problem here that the United States does not seem to be driving policy. And every time it tries, it gets pulled into a conflict it didn't intend to focus on. Thank you. Speaking of the short term potentially lingering for, for a time, do you expect that the Russian aggression will stop with or stay solely focused on Ukraine? Or is there a possibility that in the near term, 
Russian aggression could turn to other former Soviet bloc countries. I guess that's uh, targeted at me. I would say that uh, uh, anything is possible, uh, but I uh, uh, would be surprised if over the short term, uh, aggression goes in other directions, but events can get out of control. Uh, that uh, I, I think uh, Russia is uh, unhappy with Georgia, but has tolerated Georgia. Uh, any efforts by Georgia to uh, join NATO would provoke um, strong reactions, but uh, Georgia has not, since the 2008 war, really not done anything that uh, would seriously antagonize uh, uh, the Russians. Uh, Belarus already, from Russia's perspective, is the ideal partner. I don't think Russia wants the tab of supporting uh, Belarus any more than I think Russia wants to pay for maintaining Ukraine. Uh, they, uh, what they want is dominance, but not ownership. Uh, and uh, uh, as to other former Soviet states, uh, uh, they certainly will continue to put pressure and be optimistic. Uh, but the idea of taking on, for example, any of the Baltic Republic strikes me as contingent on things really getting out of control in a way that would be terrifying for many reasons. I don't think it's in the short term plans of the Russians, although they're open to opportunities if they arise. I mean, I think it was striking to hear Putin's speech the other night and to see the breadth of the claims he was and the breadth of the theories he was invoking, which certainly suggests potentially broader claims that go well beyond Ukraine. But I, I agree completely with Paul. I think that would be shocking and incredibly risky. Um, now, on the other hand, perhaps so is the invasion of Ukraine. So, you know, I think predictions, uh, yeah, we're, we're in a situation that many people would not have predicted a few months ago. So, uh, you know, I think that's a bit worth bearing in mind. But that's the that's the deliberate Russian strategy and Russian plans. I think there is, I, I'm very worried about the risk of accidentally going off the rails here. Um, we've already seen with respect to like the, the wiper malware that's shown up in Ukraine, showed up a little bit in Lithuania and in Latvia. It turned out, I think that those were like government contractors who were linked to Ukraine in some way. But Russia is playing with conventional force very close to the borders of NATO allies, the cyber um, aspect of this could very easily cross borders and end up in NATO countries. So I think there's, you know, there's a question about deliberate strategy and then there's a question about accidental escalation. And as between the two, I'm, I'm more concerned about the latter. Me too. This question is more directed towards Professor Eichen, sir. Um, how will the typical armed attack analysis apply if Russia commits a cyber attack on the United States? Yeah, so again, this we would be in an extremely escal escalatory posture if this happened. Um, there's been longstanding debate among states, among academics about how exactly existing international law with respect to armed conflict and other international law violations applies to cyber incidents. I would say that there is emerging consensus among states that a cyber attack that has um, impacts that are of, has sort of scale and effects or impacts that are similar to a conventional armed attack would be considered an armed attack. So a cyber attack that blows something up, that causes physical destruction, that would be considered to be an armed attack. It's worth bearing in mind that the United States actually conflates use of force and armed attack, which most states do not. So most states see use of force as a, as a lesser um, level of force than an armed attack is. An armed attack is the thing that triggers a right of you to use force in self-defense. Now, there, there have been extraordinarily few um, cyber incidents that rise to the level of the use of force or an armed attack. So I think that the bigger challenge for the United States, for other countries, is how to deal with um, cyber attacks that fall below that threshold, which is where the, the sort of gray zone conflict, which is where the vast majority of cyber attacks have fallen. Um, so things that are, they, they don't look like bombs and missiles, right? They're disruptive attacks, they're wiper malware, that sort of thing. Um, and states disagree. There's debate about whether there is such a thing as a violation of sovereignty as a separate legal rule. Um, the United Kingdom has very clearly said that it does not believe that that sort of low level violation of international law 
is a thing. They think that sovereignty is a principle, it's not a rule in international law. The United States has been cagey. Uh, it seems to suggest that it sides with the, the UK, but hasn't taken a very clear position. Some of the European allies, though, have said that there is, a, is such a thing as a violation of sovereignty that is an internationally wrongful act. And so for those, for those countries, it's fairly easy to see how they would characterize a uh, you know, cyber attack well below the use of armed force or um, armed attack as being a violation of international law. It's a little bit more difficult for the UK and potentially the US, but that's deliberately so because it gives them a little bit more freedom of movement as well. So we'd have to know, to, to answer the question directly, you'd have to know the specifics of what the attack looked like and, and figure out what countries are involved to know how it would be classified legally. But we've seen very few examples of cyber attacks that would rise to the level of the user force, much less an armed attack. I'd like to turn, there's several questions that we have about sanctions and I'll try and combine them. Um, yesterday in his speech, President Biden mentioned that personal sanctions on Putin were a possibility that was on the table. What would personal sanctions of Putin look like? And combining with that question, who will be harmed the most by the proposed sanctions that President Biden announced yesterday? Do you expect them to be effective in putting pressure on Russia to rethink its behavior? Or do you think that the pain of the sanctions may be felt just as much at home in terms of inflation, gas prices, and the like? Uh, well, uh, the jump in, I'm just not sure what personal sanctions on Putin means after the interference in the 2016 election. We did target people around Putin, people who we thought were his wealth bearers overseas. So, I mean, we could go further down that line. Uh, if we sanction him as a head of state, uh, try to restrict his movement, for example, that is complicated. I mean, we could do it, but there would be pushback to say the least. Um, uh, I also, I, I, I worry that people personalize this conflict. It's, you know, Putin the madman paradigm uh, Putin, the anomaly as a Russian leader, uh, I, I, I want to observe, this isn't really responsive to the question, but I feel necessary to say, when we see people on the streets of Russian cities protesting this invasion, we're looking at hundreds of people, we're not looking at millions. Uh, I, 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 and if we look back at what happened in 2014, Alexei Navalny, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, uh, Solzhenitsyn's widow, widow uh, all endorsed the annexation of Crimea. So, uh, and, and indeed I feel that Putin is uh, one of the less bad options we can see as a counterparty leading Russia. So uh, uh, this is not really responsive to the question, but I, I really want to counsel against personalizing this conflict is about bad Putin, and if he's eliminated, that somehow the problem will go away. I, I strongly disagree with, with that. And I think one thing that's a little bit unclear to me, and, and Paul may be able to shed some light on this, is what the United States expects to happen in response to sanctions. Um, you know, it's obviously the sanctions are intended in various ways to put pressure on the Russian government, the Russian economy to, to squeeze Russia in various ways to as punishment for the invasion. And I think that all makes sense. But um, part of what's been interesting to watch this week is the extent to which you know, taking Paul's caution about not personalizing the conflict. I'm not sure where the other power centers are in um, Russia right now. Like, who are we expecting to stand up to Putin and pressure him to change his mind? If, if, if indeed this is a personal decision and he's the one driving the policy, then we need to have some sort of idea of who the, the counterparts are who, who have influence with him, who can change his mind and get him to back off. Now, that's one, that's the that sanctions as coercive and attempting to coerce a change in policy. It's also possi possible that they're just punitive. Um, but I, I guess I don't have a lot of clarity at the moment about whose mind um, the United States is hoping to change, whether it's Putin or whether it's some of the, the Russian elites who are also being targeted by these uh, individualized sanctions. If I can jump back in, I, I think the three 
maximalist sanctions that we could impose uh, are a detachment from the SWIFT system, uh, which would isolate Russian banking or more precisely require them to work through China and cryptocurrency, uh, which would be costly. Uh, B, uh, going after everything connected with the uh, oligarchs and uh, the sort of the pyramid of corruption with uh, Putin at its peak, uh, which would involve expelling all these kids from Eton and other English boarding schools, uh, taking back their soccer teams and uh, uh, real estate holdings in, in England and, and comparable uh, measures in New York and LA as well. Um, and then thirdly, uh, uh, trying to erect a uh, multilateral boycott of their energy products, um, uh, I, uh, because ultimately their economy depends on energy. Uh, and uh, I, I think that it would require really inspiring leadership and a great deal of the spirit of sacrifice and resilience on the part of the US and Europe to do that, because those will hurt us a lot. It will hurt them more, but it will hurt us a lot. And, and part of the Russian attitude is, I think, is you guys don't know anything about deprivation and suffering. We can always out suffer you. Another question asks if another possibility, another possible consequence rather for Russia could be removal from the UN Security Council. Is that a feasible possibility that the other members could even entertain? Oh. Kristen, that's yours. <laughs> I think you've already answered it. Uh, so the, the answer to that is no. I mean, there is, um, I saw a suggestion on Twitter uh, from uh, David Kay, who's a law professor at UC Irvine, about um, you know, removing Russia from the UN Human Rights Council. You might be asking, how is Russia on the UN Human Rights Council? And that would be a good question. Um, there are a lot of countries with very problematic human rights records on the UN Human Rights Council, but there is a provision in um, the UN General Assembly resolution that established the Human Rights Council for removing or suspending members, um, I think with a two thirds vote of the, the, uh, the General Assembly, if they engage in gross and systemic human rights abuses. So the Human Rights Council is not the Security Council, but there, there may be uh, sort of punishment coming in various forms within the United Nations. There's, there's a vote being taken today in the Security Council that Russia is expected to veto, um, but there's no way I know of to get them off the Security Council. I have a question here about the Minsk agreements. Had the West insisted on the implementation of the Minsk agreements uh, in the way that they had been approved by the UN Security Council, could we have avoided the current state of affairs? Do you see it as a lost opportunity? Why are the Ukrainian political elites concerned so greatly right now about the federalization of their country? So let me take a whack at that. Uh, there were different interpretations of what Minsk II, Minsk I was the breakup of the Soviet Union. Uh, Minsk II, uh, was about the breakup of Ukraine, really. I mean, that is to say the condition for uh, the cessation of active Russian support of measures in Eastern Ukraine was talks leading to a federalization of Ukraine. Uh, and at least the Russian conception of that, and the agreement did not preclude this, was uh, federalization meant uh, with effective veto power so that the uh, Lukyansk and Donetsk would remain in Ukraine, but in a structure that gave them a veto over things like joining NATO. Uh, and and uh, I, I think that was a structure that was acceptable uh, to Russia, but after the annexation of Crimea uh, was a very tough sell for the Ukrainians. Moving to back to cryptocurrency, which you alluded to a few moments ago, I, do you suppose that there is an element that there have been reports that both sides have looked to cryptocurrency amidst financial instability and as a way to avoid sanctions? You spoke about removing Russia from swift access. But what would be the cybersecurity implications of? Russia being forced to turn to crypto and to Chinese banking. 
Um, I mean, obviously it would be an inconvenience to them, but I think you know, crypt cryptocurrency is not a panacea for all their woes. Um, the United States, the Biden administration in the last few months has done some interesting things with respect to cryptocurrency and particularly with respect to ransomware. So ransomware payments are often um, demanded that the ransoms be paid in cryptocurrency. And in a couple of instances, the Biden administration has been able to recover those payments, showing that it is actually possible to uh, sort of pierce the anonymity that some people think exists with respect to cryptocurrency. And they've begun sanctioning cryptocurrency exchanges um, for basically exchanges that are uh, facilitating criminal activity and ransomware. So I think that shifting to cryptocurrency um, may just make that the next target of sanctions. I don't know that that would it would, it would complicate uh, Russia's you know, financial situation and financial capacities. And I don't know that that would really uh, let them escape US sanctions. If I could just quickly uh, add, uh, first of all, I think the Biden administration has been great on dealing with uh, cryptocurrency, particularly the showing how that the most uh, widely circulated media such as Bitcoin can be unraveled with diligent, but very doable police work. Um, I, I am a anti-cryptocurrency radical. Uh, I wish that our policy would be the same as the Chinese, which is the outlaw crypto mining and the use of cryptocurrency. Uh, I, I fail to see the social benefit of cryptocurrency once you think money laundering is a bad thing. Uh, uh, but I, I think we've already done a lot, I would like to see us do even more. Uh, I, I think cryptocurrency is an abomination. Here's a question, two questions related to the longer term results of this current situation. What countries, if any, do you think the U, that Ukraine would formally ask to contribute to its self-defense? And at this time, do you see any realistic possibility of the US declaring articles of war against Russia in light of this situation? No. And I don't see any country that is willing to commit its own forces on Ukrainian territory. Uh, I, I, I think uh, the talk of organizing a Ukrainian armed resistance to a Russian invasion is uh, concerning, quite honestly. I think that is also something that can get out of control and it would implicate uh, for the United States uh, a certain international legal problems. It would at least require us to develop a, a use ad bellum framework for dealing with that problem, which is a line we have not yet crossed. And I, I think uh, that is to say applying to us and binding us under the use in Bello. And uh, I hope we don't go there. Okay, the next question. Um, strategically, could you elaborate on what Russia is getting out of this invasion that they did not already have from the annexation of Crimea? And because Professor Stephen, I think that is more directed toward you. There was also a question about you made the comment earlier that this situation could very likely get out of control from the perspective of Russia. Could you elaborate on what you meant by that remark? So the first point, I, I, I think that they, uh, 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 what they may get out of it, what they hope they get out of it is uh, a tame Ukraine and a chastised West. And under uh, their most optimistic scenario, that's what they'll get. And, and I, I think the calculus was that it was a gamble worth taking. Uh, uh, from the perspective of the West, we can hope they were wrong, but I, I think that's what they were thinking. Um, uh, from, repeat the second question, please. Uh, the second question was if you could elaborate on your remark that the situation could get out of control. Well, I, I think uh, Kristen has already identified uh, some of the things that could spiral out of control. I think the basic point is that when you go to war, your plans evaporate upon point of uh, contact. I mean, that's an aphorism of the military. And uh, 
the idea that from uh, a uh, situation room that you somehow, uh, with all the great toys you have, you are somehow in control of events is illusory. We have found that to be true in many situations. And by we, I mean uh, all powers uh, uh, and, and uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the cyber war could lead to uh, kinetic war, could lead to disaster, uh, uh, that a uh, escalation of sanctions could lead to a general economic crisis. Uh, uh, th these are all worst case scenarios. I don't think they're highly likely, but uh, they are not to be played with as prospects. Professor Eichen, so you've mentioned concerns about cyber attacks and we've spoken about that quite a bit. Do you also think there's cause for concern about continued or escalated Russian misinformation attacks at this time? Look, I would fully expect Russia to continue engaging in disinformation campaigns. I mean, we've seen that in their official statements of late, um, so it's not exactly masked. And, you know, I, I think the question is really how effective will those be? Um, it's something that caught, has caught the United States off guard in the past, particularly with respect to the 2016 election. I don't think anybody's going to be caught particularly off guard at this point. Um, Russia is using uh, disinformation campaigns to sow chaos, to stoke divisions. But this is something it's been doing um, in the United States and other places, including Ukraine for a number of years. So I think it will continue. I think um, people are better prepared for it now. Uh, so, you know, how much of an effect it will have, I'm not sure. Question for both of you. Yesterday, there was a post by professors Hathaway and Shapiro on just security that argued that the very fact that sanctions imposed by the US and allies is evidence of international law working as it's intended to. Do you agree with this? Or would you argue that there is more that we can learn from this incident and there are other ways that international law could develop and function better in future situations such as this one? Go ahead. <laughs> so uh, I, I uh, published an article a few months ago about Crimea, but uh, part of the uh, argument of that article was as much as I admire Professor, Professor Hathaway and Shapiro, both of whom we tried to hire for our faculty and who I think are terrific. Um, I, I, I think their take on Yusad Bellum is a uh, optimistic one, uh, uh, an idealized one. And, and I think there's plenty of room for those kind of arguments. Uh, I, I uh, glanced briefly at their op-ed piece yesterday and thought, we really have a glass half full, glass half empty problem. Uh, that, uh, th that there is some cooperation in response to this shows that, shows that there's something going on, whether uh, what is going on is sufficient to the purpose um, remains to be seen and how this will play out in the future and how people We'll look at this in two years and five years and 10 years, very much remains to be seen. I think that particularly that last point I agree with. I, I think we are in such early days of the, the latest developments here that it's hard to know what this is gonna look like uh, in retrospect. We are, we are very much not looking at this in retrospect yet. I mean, I think their, their piece makes some good points in terms of um, the fact that the existing rules of international law are so clear and this, that this violation is so flagrant has allowed these condemnations to be done quickly and to be put in legal terms. So one thing we constantly see with respect to, to cyber attacks is denunciations are often slow, they're fragmentary, and they're not even framed as legal violations because there's no agreement among states about where the legal lines are in a lot of circumstances. So it, it is striking to see uh, you know, a lot of widespread agreement, not perfect agreement, see China, but a lot of widespread agreement that this is a legal violation and a big one. Um, so that's, that's the glass half full piece. But I also think they're, they're right on the, the optimistic take that this, isn't, this doesn't necessarily single the end of the international legal order. This is the international legal order reacting in much the way it is supposed to. Um, 
understanding though that there's been a failure here. I mean, you it sort of depends what what you expect from the international legal order. What is it that you thought it would accomplish? If you thought it would stop this conflict, it's failed. If you think the the job of the international legal order is a to use a longer horizon and address violations, then there's still room for optimism. So I think that's the glass half full piece um, of their of their piece that I agree with. Professor Stephen, Professor Eichen, Sarah, on behalf of the Federalist Society at UVA Law and our co-sponsors, I see that we are now at time. Thank you so much for participating in this event today. To our audience, thank you for your interesting questions. Uh, I hope everyone has enjoyed the event and thank you again for both of you participating. Have a nice day, thank everyone. Thank you for having us. Thank you.